A successful automotive project takes planning and organization. But instead of using an old tablet or notebook, there's the Gears Deluxe Project Planning Book. This was designed to help you lay out a project, the parts, the tools, costs, and keep it organized with colored tabs, a pouch for receipts, and even a place to attach photos. If you decide to sell the vehicle, it serves as a complete history of what's been done. If you have a project or plan on starting one, the Gears Project Planning Book is the best way to lay it out and make it happen. You know, over the years, there have been some awesome cars that have hit the streets. Fords, Chevys, Dodges, Ferraris, Porsches, Lamborghinis. There's a lot of cool stuff. But when you start asking people to actually list the top cars that they'd like to have in their garage, well, you notice that a lot of the same vehicles start showing up. And at the top of just about every list is the legendary Shelby Cobra. Now, the Cobra was the brainchild of Texas chicken farmer Carol Shelby, whose idea was not to build an automotive icon, no, it was to beat the snot out of Ferrari on the racetrack. And he did just that by stuffing a massive 427 Ford engine into a tiny roadster body. And the Cobra was not only brutally fast, it looked the part too, with huge tires and big muscular flares. Hey, do these fenders make my butt look big? Barely legal side pipes bellowing in your face and a front end that, that looked like it was ready to devour anything that got in its path. Yeah, the Cobra was one of the most macho, testosterone-driven muscle machines ever built. And every gearhead would love to own one. Unfortunately, this <laughs> is about as close as the average guy is gonna get to owning a Cobra. Because if you wanna buy an original, you can figure on spending around a million bucks. Matter of fact, Carroll Shelby just sold his personal car for five and a half million dollars at auction. Heck, even a nice replica like the Superformance car, that's gonna run you 60,000 or more. Now, you know, that's all fine and everything, but the problem is everything has gotten so far away from what the original idea for the Cobra was. And that was to go really fast for a reasonable amount of money. So today, I'm gonna to show you how to build a car that's just as quick as a Cobra, or a Z06 Vet, or a Porsche, or a Viper, or any of those other high dollar cars, except we're gonna do it for around 20 grand or less, and we're gonna do it with that. Now wait, wait, I know what you're thinking. What? A Mazda Miata? Are you crazy? That's a, that's a girl's car, man. Well, you, you've desecrated a whole Shelby legend with that. <laughs> Wait, let me ask you a question. What do you think that Carol Shelby started with? He started with a British girl's car. An AC Ace, man. Nobody drove an AC Ace. If you wanted a real sports car, you got a, an Austin Healey or a Jaguar, not, a, not an AC Ace, it was a sissy car. La, 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 la. And the reason Carroll Shelby used that is because that's all he had access to. And he took that British girl's car, put in some American horsepower, and gave us the Cobra. So, I'm gonna take this Japanese girl's car stick in some American horsepower, and I'm gonna give you a project called the Banshee, because this is gonna be a screaming mother when it's done. The cool thing about this project is, though, this is something that you can build in your garage. Now, as you probably guessed, the first step of this project is to stuff a V8 into a Mazda Miata. That's right, a V8 in a Mazda Miata. Now, obviously, to pull this off, the first thing you need is a car. 
And what you're going to be looking for is a 90 through 97 first generation Mazda Miata. You can pick these things up anywhere because Mazda made a billion of them. I got this one off of eBay for 2,500 bucks because the motor's bad, which makes it the perfect candidate for a V8 swap. Bad engine, good body. And that brings up a point that's worth mentioning. You want to find the best donor vehicle that you can. You don't want something that's got rust on it. You don't want something that's been in a wreck. And the reason being is you don't need to. It's not like this is a 69 Camaro that you can't find. You can get these things anywhere. So just keep looking until you find a vehicle that's in good shape. Now, putting a V8 into a Miata brings up a lot of questions like, what engine do you put in here? And what about suspension and transmission? And how about the rear end and the wiring and the cooling? And will it fly or will it break in half? And oh, stop. We're going to answer all those questions as I put this car together. But the first thing you need to do is get hold of a place called Monster Miata. They've been doing V8 swaps in these cars for years, and they have got it dialed in. Check this out. Now, what you're looking at here is a kit to mount a 302 Ford into a Mazda Miata. And it starts out with a modified K-member and an oil pan so you can drop that motor down in there and mount it and not have any clearance issues. You also have a new transmission mount, rear end mount, modified hubs, a special set of headers so you don't have any clearance issues, stronger axles for the rear, a new drive shaft, motor mounts, front springs to handle the extra weight, all kinds of bracketry, you also have dual electric fans from TriPak and a Saldana aluminum radiator to keep everything cool. The best part is though, you get this manual that outlines all of the electrical connections, power steering, the brakes, the air conditioning, everything to put a Ford into a Mazda and make it all work correctly. Now, this kit's gonna set you back about 4,000 bucks, but when you take into account what it would cost you to build all this stuff and engineer it, make it all fit right, I think you're gonna agree that this is a heck of a deal. And that brings me up to the engine. Now, the guys at Monster Miata actually designed their kit around a late model fuel-injected Mustang engine, and they did that for a couple of reasons. First of all, you can pick up one of these things at any salvage yard across the United States for a few hundred bucks, and then they have all the emissions stuff on them. So you can put the engine in and pass emissions. That's a cool thing. However, any hot rod small block Ford engine will work. And we're definitely putting in more power than a stock Mustang had. And we're gonna talk about that here in a bit. But first, we need to make some room. So it's time to start tearing things apart. We're gonna start slow by disconnecting all of the electrical connections under the hood. Now, make sure that you are clearly labeling them as you go, because a lot of them you'll need to reuse on the new engine. The next step is all the cables and the hoses and the lines. Once again, make a note where they go to prevent confusion when it all goes back together. Finally, we're ready to start pulling parts out. Now we're going to make two piles. One of things that we're going to chuck and one of things that we're going to keep. Now, obviously, pre-planning is very important on a project like this. And one thing that's easy to overlook is air conditioning. Now, if you're working on a vehicle that's air conditioned, it is very important that you take it down, have the system evacuated so there's no pressure in it, before you start taking fittings off. Because if you don't, you're going to have a heck of a mess. So a little pre-planning is important here. All right, now it's time to get this thing up in the air so we can get underneath it. Now, don't get nervous on me here. You can actually do this project by just jacking up the car and putting jack stands underneath it. But having a lift will definitely make it easier. Once the car is in the air, the serious disassembly can begin. So first, we'll get rid of all the plastic shrouding and cut all the hoses.
The air conditioning condenser drops out really easy and we'll definitely want to reuse that. So it will go in our keep and reuse pile. The exhaust, of course, will not be reused and will usually require a little more persuasion to get out. And a Sawzall is a great persuader. While we're at it, this is also a good time to get that little drive shaft out of the way, because we won't be needing that anymore either. Now, so far, this disassembly has been pretty straightforward. Now is when it gets a little interesting. Come here, I got something to show you. First of all, notice that there is no transmission cross member under here. I mean, it's just all wide open. That's because the Miata uses a system that's generally called a torque arm. Now what that is, is this big frame that runs all the way up and bolts to the transmission and then goes all the way back and bolts to the rear end. Now, a lot of cars have used this system over the years and it does a good job, but we're gonna get rid of all this stuff because we are not just putting in a V8, no. We are upgrading the whole drivetrain so it's strong enough to handle a V8. That brings up the biggest question that people ask about this project. Is the Miata body actually strong enough to handle a V8? Or is this just gonna fold up like a tuna can? <laughs> That's a good question. Those of you that are familiar with unibody cars, Mustangs, Camaros, that kind of stuff, know that there is a subframe in the front and a subframe in the rear. And the way to make the car stiffer is to weld in subframe connectors. But notice on the Miata, you don't just have a subframe. The frame continues all the way down the side of the car. So these come from the factory with a full frame under them. So they're incredibly stiff and strong. Believe it or not, that is enough to handle a V8. But you can also see why it's very important that these are not bent up or rusty. You have got to start with a good car. With the torque arm out of the way, we'll pop the axles loose. And then unbolt the differential. Now here's a surprise for you. I bet you did not expect all of this stuff to come out. Like I said, we are changing everything. Oh no, no, we're not done yet. No, the good news is though, it is finally time to pull out the motor and tranny. So we're gonna get the hoist in place and we're gonna jerk that thing out of here. Right there. One of the key things to watch is your fingers. Oh! <laughs> I'm kidding! Forward. Keep going. I think we can get it from here. Go ahead and roll it straight back. There it is. The original Mazda drivetrain. Now, the cool thing about tearing apart a Miata, besides the fact that it's fun, is that these parts are actually valuable. So don't just junk them. Put them on eBay, drag them to a swap meet, and put some money back in your pocket. Now, believe it or not, the stock engine compartment on a Miata is almost big enough to handle a small block Ford. Almost. Right back here is where we're gonna have to do some cutting. First, we'll move the brake lines out of the way, then take the templates that come with the kit and mark your cuts. Now just cut them out using a cutoff wheel, an air saw, or a plasma cutter. Now I prefer an air saw here because it's so easy to make nice precision cuts with it. Next, we'll take a grinder and dress up the cuts. All right. Now, for those of you that are a little nervous, you can just relax because we have not cut any structural strength out of the body of this car. Look at this, there's your firewall. Here's your frame rails, everything is still very strong. All we did do is cut out some old corners that weren't doing anything except taking up some space. So now we got some room for a V8 to shove in here. Now the next step is to take these plates that come with the kit and we'll fit them into these areas. Now make sure that you take some time to trim them down 
and make sure they fit good because the idea here is to make this look like a factory install, not just some backyard hacker deal. Remember, it's all in the details. Cool down a little bit. And there it is. Now once we get a coat of paint on that, you'll never know that didn't come from the factory that way. Now obviously the radiator that we're using for the V8 is considerably larger than what came in here stock. So all these mounting brackets here are the next thing to go. Now, the new transmission that we're going to be using is a T5. So, to make room for the bell housing, this driver's side tunnel needs to go in about a half inch here in this area. So, we are going to use everybody's favorite tool, the big <laughs> fancy hammer. <laughs> Now, like I said before, the new transmission that's going in here is a T5 five-speed. So to get it to fit, we're going to have to do just a little bit of minor modification to the shifter hole. So out comes the saw. Now, the good news is these modifications are so minor that you're going to be able to slip the original console right back in place, and you'll never know that that's there. It's going to look stock. It's going to look factory until you start slamming gears. Now, I know at this point it seems like there's not a whole lot left to take off this car, but we're not done yet. Remember, there is a brand new K member sitting over there on the table, which means obviously the old one's got to come out. And of course, that means the whole front suspension's got to go too, but it's not that bad. Eight bolts is all that holds this in, so we'll take those off and wheel this whole mess out from under the car. I've got it. There you go, Chris. <laughs> now, at this point, you're probably thinking, what a mess. I mean, it looks like the car exploded. There's more parts out here than there are on the car. Why in the world would somebody do this to a perfectly good Miata? Well, I've got some reasons for you. First of all, if you build this project using a salvage yard motor like this, it's very easy to roll this project in for under 10,000 bucks. Also, according to Monster Miata, if you use a stock HO Mustang engine, about 250 horse, in that car, you can run zero to 60 in around 4.8 seconds, and you can run the quarter mile in the high 12s. Guys, these are smoking numbers, but I think he's smoking enough. <laughs> oh. Are you kidding? We want to run with Cobras and Corvettes and Vipers. Oh, that's why we are putting in a 400 horse Keith Craft racing engine, because we want that little sucker to really scream like a, like a banshee. Now, doing a project like this brings up an interesting problem. How do you take a car that's generally viewed as a, as a girl's car and give it some balls. Well, you do it the same way that Carroll Shelby did back with the ACAs. You stick in a V8 and you go racing. And that brings us up to where we are today. Now, the kit that we're using to do this swap comes from a place called Monster Miata, and it's designed around utilizing a late model fuel injected Mustang engine. And this thing will make those cars really cook, but we're going to want more heat than this. So we are going to put in a 400 horse 302 that we got from Keith Craft Racing. This engine is stuffed with Mall flat top forged pistons and Eagle H-beam rods. The heads are high flowing Brodex aluminum heads and they're packed with stainless steel valves, screw in studs and guide plates, and of course roller rockers. Now on top we kept it simple. We have a Wyan Stealth Intake Manifold and a Holly Street Avenger Carburetor 
topped off with their high-tech air cleaner. The best part is, all of the engines that come from Keithcraft Racing come with the dyno sheets and all the documentation so you know you're getting exactly what you paid for. Now this engine dynoed at 403 horsepower, 390 foot-pounds of torque, all packed into a nice, tight little package. Now, before you go ahead and just stick an engine into your project, you need to slow down a little bit here. You've spent a lot of time on your engine, a lot of time on your project. Don't just stick things in ugly. No, man, take the time to clean them up, paint them to make them look good. Now, the paint that I put on this engine is a metallic gold pearl that's a base clear. I mean, it's a real automotive paint. And I did that for a couple of reasons. First of all, it's extremely durable. Second of all, it just looks incredible. But if you don't want to go that far, just, just something out of a spray can will be great. That way, when you go to pop the hood for your buddies and show off the project, you'll be proud of it. Now, I know that you're wondering about this blue paint inside here. Ah, we're going to tell you about that when we get to that part of the project. Right now, we still need to dress this engine. Now, everybody knows that this is not a complete engine. I mean, there's no accessories on it, so we got to put something on there. Now, you can reuse all of this original stuff. It'll bolt right in place, the pulleys, the brackets, the accessories, but <laughs> I'm telling you, the ugly factor on something like this is just huge. That system on this engine would just kill the looks of it. So, what are you gonna do? Well, the answer came from a place called Zoops Products in what they call the Positrack system. And just laying here on the table, it looks better than that old stock engine. Now, basically what it is is a super compact, low profile serpentine belt system. And you are not gonna believe how easy it goes on. Now, the kit includes polished pulleys, billet support bracket that's got the idler pulley, a polished alternator, air conditioning compressor, power steering pump, and finally, a billet support bracket that's got the idler pulley. Now obviously, this is a fantastic looking system with all the polished aluminum and the brackets and the components, but building a car is not just about making something look good. No, it's got to have a function to it. And I picked this system because of its size. Come here, take a look at this. Notice everything is back and nothing comes forward of the water pump. And then the sides, look how the sides are tucked in. Nothing comes outside of the heads. This is gonna be perfect in that little tiny engine compartment. Matter of fact, if you're building a truck or a muscle car or a street rod and space under the hood is important, this is the only way to go. Now, for those of you that are thinking, oh, you know, that's great, but it's expensive and I'm on a budget and that's what I'm gonna do. Well, that's valid. But let me ask you something. Are you really going to use a junkyard alternator and power steering pump and air conditioning compressor? No, you're not. You're gonna end up going down to the local auto parts store and replacing that and that and that. And by the time you do all of that, you're gonna end up with almost as much money in that as you would have in this. But you still have that, which makes doing it that way not as cheap as you thought. Now, to actually physically mount a V8 in this car, you have two choices. You can either mount the subframe, drop the motor in from the top, and then assemble the clutch and the transmission on out in a traditional way, or you can assemble the whole drivetrain on the subframe on the ground, roll it under the car, and mount it from the bottom. Now, if you have access to a lift or just some way to get the front end of the car off the ground, this is the best way to do it. So that is what we're gonna do. The first step is to mount the steering rack to the new subframe. Now, if it's questionable or your tie rod ends are bad, now's the time to replace them. Got your side. Now you can see how this monster Miata subframe and pan all work together with the steering. Now, it is tight, but it's all serviceable and all functional. Okay, with the engine on rollers and ready to go, it's time for the clutch and the flywheel. And for that, we went to Zoom because we want something that's gonna perform and something that's going to last. Now the flywheel is this super cool aluminum flywheel that only weighs 12 pounds. And this is gonna allow that engine to wind like crazy. It's also gonna lessen a little bit of that low end torque so I don't just blow the tires away every time I launch it. If you're gonna run a road course, that is a great setup. 
Now the clutch is just as cool because it features Kevlar friction material. Now the reason Kevlar is cool is that it grips better and it lasts longer than the conventional stuff. The only drawback to using Kevlar is it has a longer break-in period, about 700 miles before you can really romp on it. <laughs> That's going to be tough. The bell housing came from the guys at Summit Racing, and it's this heavy-duty McLeod blow-proof bell housing. Now, the purpose of something like this is to contain the clutch should it ever blow apart in a racing or a high-performance situation, because the shrapnel from an exploding clutch can do some serious damage to you, not to mention what it'll do to the car. Now, if you're just building the car to run on the street, this is probably a little bit of overkill. I mean, <laughs> you really don't need anything quite this heavy-duty. However, if you're going to be running down the track, this is not only a good idea, but it's usually required to pass a safety inspection. So make sure you're planning ahead here. Now, the only modification you're going to have to do to it is you're going to have to take the stock Miata slave cylinder and mount it on the bell housing to actuate the clutch for it. And of course, the bracket from Monster Miata is included to do this. All right, what about a starter? Yeah, we got one. We got that little jewel from Tough Stuff Performance because they specialize in high performance components that look good. So it's gonna match what we're doing here. And it just slides right into the pocket. The last piece to this puzzle is the transmission. And what I've got here is a brand new T5 five speed that we got from Summit Racing. And of course, it's just gonna slide right into that bell housing and fit up perfect. Now, the reason that the T5 is such a perfect transmission for this swap is it's compact, lightweight, but it's strong enough to handle the 400 horsepower and 400 foot-pounds we're gonna be throwing at it. Now, just barely, but it is strong enough to handle that. Now, I know you're looking at all this stuff going, man, that's a lot of stuff. How's that all gonna fit in the car? Well, I promise you, if you hang with me here, I'm gonna show you how all this slides in with no cussing and no pounding with the BFH. <laughs> All right, with the subframe all bolted up, <laughs> the engine's pretty much in, except for this cross member. Now to mount that, all you have to do is jack it into place, drill some holes, and bolt it up. <laughs> and that's it, guys. The new drivetrain is in. Now, <laughs> I know you're thinking, no way. There is no way that that just slid in that easy. There has got to be some clearance problems. What are you not showing us? Now, come here. Take a look at this. You've got all kinds of room around the transmission. You've got room around the slave cylinder. The blowproof bell housing, I clearanced that before I put that in, so I know that was gonna fit. But take a look at this. Here's your headers. Now, that is tight, but there's plenty of room, so when the motor rocks, it's not gonna come up and hit the body. Everywhere you look, there is just enough room. <laughs> it's tight, but I'll tell you what, it looks like it came from the factory in there. Okay, the engine is in place. The transmission is in place. What are we gonna do about the rear end? I mean, how are we gonna handle all that power? Well, the kit comes with a bracket to mount a new rear end, but to find the rear end that fits this bracket, you get to do a little bit of hunting. So we went down to our friends at Shrum Auto Salvage and picked up a rear end out of a late 80s, early 90s Ford Thunderbird. Now I know what you're thinking. A 7.5, isn't that kind of small? <laughs> That's exactly what I thought. But the guys at Monster Miata assured me that the 7.5 and the CV joints are plenty strong enough to handle over 400 foot-pounds of torque. Matter of fact, they say they've even got guys running in the tens with these and not scattering them all over the track. So we'll see. 
Now, one of the good things about using a 7.5 is all you got to do is clean it up, pull out the stock open differential, stuff in a limited slip differential from Ford Racing, and you're ready to go because you definitely want both tires digging on something like this. Now, the mounting bracket is very simple. All you do is press these bushings out of the stock rear end, slide them in here, and go bolt this in. Now all we have to do is mount the front of the rear end so it doesn't move around on us. And that is where this torque plate comes in because it fits above the rear end. You weld it to the cross member and then the rear end just bolts to it. All right. Just got a couple of things to say. This is a welder. That is a gas tank. They make a beautiful explosion together and you get to play a harp. Make sure you know your surroundings before you start torching. The last thing that we're going to deal with are the axles. Now, once again, we are using some new and used parts. Take a look at this. The outers and the CV joints are the Ford units that came from the junkyard. But we pulled out these weaker axles and slid in these stronger axles that came with the kit, giving us a much stronger assembly. Now, to put this in, that end slides into the differential. This goes through the spindle and then into this modified Miata hub that also comes with a kit. And then you are ready to rock. And that gets all the major hurdles out of the way. The rear end and axles in place. The transmission and cross member in place. The subframe and the V8 in place. I told you a V8 would fit in this car. Now, the Monster Miata kit actually comes with a really nice spring setup. They send heavier springs for the front to handle the weight of the V8. And then you take your existing front springs, cut a coil out of it and use those on the rear. Now, if I was driving this car primarily on the street, this is what I would do. I mean, this is well engineered, it's very effective. Unfortunately, this car is gonna spend a lot of time on the tracks and road courses. So I not only need something that will handle the weight of the V8, but is also adjustable and tunable. So we are gonna start with these Coney shocks. Now, these are a gas shock that, like I said, are fully tunable to whatever driving situation that you've got. And then we're gonna pack them with these Eibach springs. Of course, the spring goes right on the shock and you adjust it with the collar. Now, obviously, we're using a heavier spring on the front for the V8, and on the rear, we've got a lighter spring. This is how they go in. Hey, you want to put this one in for me? You want to put it in? <laughs> yeah, that's what I thought. Show us a smile. <laughs> Now, you don't have to be stuffing a V8 into one of these things to benefit from a shock and spring upgrade. <laughs> There's a lot of guys that are spec racing these cars with a stock four cylinder in them, and they're just doing fantastic. So, that goes to show you that there's a lot more to these cars than just cruising them all. Now, onto the brakes. Obviously, brakes are a huge issue on any project, but especially something that's gonna have the velocity of that car. And brakes is one of those issues where size matters. Hey so we went to our buddies at Bear Brakes and got the system that they have for the Mazda Miata. Now look at this, check this out. What they do is convert from the tiny 10 inch rotor to this huge 12 and a half inch drilled and slotted rotor. Now to go with that, you have a dual piston caliper and of course all the hoses and hardware to hook it up. Now I know this looks huge, looks like it'll never fit. 
But believe me, this will go right in place of your stock brakes, and that's what we're going to show you. Once you have your old brakes off, make sure that you spend a little time in here cleaning things up, making them look good while you've got everything apart. You'll be glad you did when all your buddies start crawling under here checking out what you got. Now, just in case you're wondering, the control arms, the spindles, the steering, these are all strong enough to handle a V8, so you don't need to upgrade those. However, you will need to check your bushings, your ball joints, and your tie rod ends, because if those are bad, now's the time to replace them. Okay, to install the new brakes, just bolt the new bracket onto the spindle, slide on the new rotor, then follow that with the caliper. And that is it. I mean, it's really that simple. You just bolt them on and boom, you got some brand new huge brakes. Matter of fact, the hardest part about this particular project is going to be finding a rim to go around it. You're going to need at least a 16-incher. We're going to deal with that a little bit later. All right, on to the rear brakes. Now, for the rear, we're doing something a little different than the front because we're staying with the stock size rotor, but not the original rotor. Oh. Now, we're also putting on these bare, drilled, and slotted rotors to give us some better braking back here. Now, the cool thing is they just slide in place of the original rotor, then we'll stick some new pads in the calipers, bolt them on, and we'll be ready to rock. Now, we have spent a lot of time with the mechanicals of this. We have a new drivetrain in it. We have springs and shocks and brakes on it. Now it's time to deal with the safety factor of a car that weighs 2,500 pounds but has a 400 horse Keithcraft racing engine in it. Yeah, I'm talking about a roll bar. Not a show bar, a real roll bar. Something that's not going to fold up on you and crush you if you accidentally get the car on its lid. Yeah, the roll bar I'm talking about comes from Hard Dog Fabrications and it's right over here. Now, since we're building a car that's going to have the flavor of a 60s style sports car, like the Cobra, this is the bar we're going to use. Now, this is called the Deuce. For obvious reasons, it's got dual hoops, very similar to the single hoop that you saw in the Cobra. Now, these are built out of thick, polished stainless steel, so they're very strong. And the mounting points were designed after years of SCCA competition. So these guys know how to protect you and keep the car looking good. Now, of course, you get all the hardware and all the brackets, everything that you're going to need to bolt this thing into your Miata. Now, when you put on a roll bar, you may want to think about upgrading your seat belts. So, we got these Willens five-point harnesses to hold us in the seats. And the cool thing about these is all the mounting points are already welded to the bar. So all you got to do is bolt them on, and you're ready to go. Now, I know your first question is, how is that big, huge roll bar going to fit in this little tiny car? I mean, there's no room here. Yeah, there is. We just need to move a few things around first, starting with this crossbar and these plastic side panels. Now, pulling out old carpet <laughs> is usually a pretty nasty experience, especially on a convertible, because people put dogs in there and they spill Cokes and all kinds of stuff. So if your carpet's bad, now's the time to replace it. However, it looks like we lucked out here because this just needs to be cleaned up. Check it out. Okay, with this gas tank cover out of the way, you can see that all of a sudden, we've got some room here. I mean, the floor has just dropped about six inches. And right in this area here, that's where the bar is going to go. So now all we have to do is just move some of these wires and cables and make room for the bar. Now, as you probably guessed, there is a little bit of trimming that has to happen here. This whole mounting flange has got to come off so the roll bar will slide into place. Now, this is where you're going to be really glad that you picked up some of these Cornwell spot weld cutters. You did pick some of those up, didn't you? I told you a few weeks ago, those are a great tool to have in your box. They're not just for restoration, because you never know when you're going to have to cut a spot weld. Once the spot welds are cut out, we'll take a saw and trim the rest. Then finish it all up with a grinder and some paint. All right, now comes the fun part, because it's time to get this thing in place. Of course, you will need an extra set of hands because it's a little awkward. All right, straight down. That's it. 
Thanks, Craig. All right, it's in, man. Look at that. It looks great. Now, how does it mount? That's the important thing. Notice we're using the factory mounting points where the original brace went, and we're also using the mounting point for the seat belts. So this is a very strong area here, but even that is not enough. So here along the sides and the back, we're going to drill the holes and then bolt it on using the supplied backing plates for a strong mount to the strongest part of the unibody. And that's one of the main differences between a roll bar meant to protect you and a show bar, which is meant just to look good. Okay, remember when I told you a little while ago about people spilling Cokes in their cars and letting their dogs drool all over everything? Well, obviously that happened in this car because this gas tank cover is all rusty. So, we just picked up another one at the local salvage yard and now we get to cut it all to pieces. So, we'll make some marks. Trim the ends. and also cut some slots in the center so it'll fit around the bar. Then, once it's bolted back in place, we'll just trim the carpet. and the plastic side panels. To fit snugly around the bars. Then, just put it all back together and you are done. Now step back, man, take a look at this. This bar looks like it came from the factory in this car and that is awesome, but it's also functional. This bar could save your life, and that is the really big deal here. Now, check this out. You still have the use of your factory seat belts if you want them, and the top still operates and clears the roll bar. That is a huge issue. If you only have money for one modification on a convertible, you need to look into a roll bar. All right, now we are going to deal with something that's been driving me crazy ever since I rolled this car in, and it's those white seats. <laughs> They are so white. I mean, it looks like pimp my shoes or something. No, those have got to go. And believe it or not, they are white leather. So they'll clean up and these things will go like hotcakes on eBay. So that's where they're gonna go. Now, the color aside, the Mazda Miata seat is not a bad seat. It's just not a performance seat. There's not much here in the side bolsters or down here in the base to hold you in the seat when you're doing some performance driving. So this is how we're gonna change that. All right, you ready for this? You never quite know what you're gonna find under a seat. <laughs> oh, hey, we got some free money. We got a, got a new screwdriver and, whoa. <laughs> I don't even wanna, <laughs> I don't know what that is. There you go. <laughs> wow, nasty, woo! <laughs> <laughs> okay, the big question now is, what are we gonna stuff in the car now that it's empty? Well, they're not gonna be white, that's for sure. No, we're putting in these pro car rallies that we got from SCAT. Now, as you can see, they've got a tremendous amount of side support here, both in the back and down in the seat bottom. This will hold us in the seat when we're doing some performance driving, but they're still comfortable enough to drive every day. It's not a full-on racing seat. And of course, they're fully adjustable and with the adjustable headrest, which is really cool. This kind of has that, that old school hot rod look, which is gonna be perfect in that car. Now, we also got some universal mounting brackets, which means you can put these seats literally in any vehicle from a, from a Jeep to a, to a sports car. It just takes a few minutes to put them in. You know, one of the first true freedoms you experience as a kid is that first bicycle. 
Man, it becomes your transportation to the world, or at least the local neighborhood. And in my neighborhood, man, we all had bikes. And we'd stick playing cards in the spokes, and we'd suck on black licorice, make it look like we were big biker dudes, and it was magic. But a bike wasn't just about transportation. No, it became an extension of your personality. And there were all kinds of bikes out there. There were 10 speeds, there were mountain bikes, there were stingrays, there were BMX bikes, and they all had their strengths and weaknesses. And that's where the idea for the story of the Purple Bicycle came from. Because just like a bike might wish it had the talents or skills of another bike, so do we sometimes overlook our God-given talents and wish we had somebody else's talents, skills, because they seem to be better than ours. It's a simple lesson, but something we all need to be reminded of from time to time. Okay, so what's next? Well, remember I told you that I was gonna upgrade these stock seat belts with these Willens harnesses to hold us in the seat when we're doing some performance driving. So that's what we're gonna do. Now the cool thing about these, they're really easy to put in, especially if you've got a roll bar. And what we've ended up with is an incredibly fast, reliable Miata. I mean, but that's great though, because all that power is tucked up under this little skin. This is the ultimate sleeper. I mean, you pull up beside somebody with this thing, they have no idea what is about to hit them. And if that's what you're into, if that's the kind of car you want to build, man, this project is done for you. All you have to do is go out and build one and then go hunt down some Corvettes and Depending on where you source your engines and what kind of parts you use, you can literally build one of these things around whatever budget. However, this is not the Banshee. <laughs> this, at this point, is just a V8 Miata. Now, I know you're thinking, wait a minute, <laughs> you're confusing me here. I thought you said this was the Banshee project. It is, but I'm not done with it yet. You really didn't think I was gonna leave this body stock, did you? Oh man, you know me better than that. Let's take a walk. Now, when Carroll Shelby stuck a V8 into the AC Ace, it looked like this. <laughs> Not the most high performance looking thing, but he didn't leave it there. No, he changed it, he stretched it, he flared it until it looked like this. Yeah, now that's what we're talking about. That's what became the Cobra. So that's what we're gonna do with the Banshee. We're gonna give it a visual punch to go along with that performance punch that it's got. And the way we're gonna do that is right there beside you. Now, what you're looking at here is a fiberglass body kit for the first generation Mazda Miata. Comes from a place called Simpson Design and he calls it the Italia. Now check this thing out. As you can see, it is loaded with all kinds of classic 60s sports car styling. I mean, you can see Ferrari influences here and Jaguar and Lotus and Maserati and Lister. I mean, they're all here. And that's the cool thing about this kit. When Jim Simpson designed it, he wasn't building a copy or a replica of any particular car. He just took the styling from all those cool cars and built an original body style. <laughs> That's sweet. Now, the back, same sort of deal. Notice it has the big flared fenders and the round tail lights, and of course the little ducktail spoiler. I mean, that's pure 60s sports car. Now, the kit also comes with little stuff like the headlight buckets, the round tail lights, even the Le Mans style flip top gas cap. I mean, this kit will totally change the look of your Miata for the better. Now, how does it go in? Well, actually, pretty simple. That front clip completely replaces all of your stock sheet metal. So that's got to come off. So get out a wrench, start the music, and let's go to work. Once the hood is out of the way, we'll move on to the headlight assemblies. 
Now, like most vehicles with retractable headlights, these are very expensive to replace and usually the first thing damaged in a wreck. So these will definitely go in the swap meet pile. The next step is to pull out these plastic inner fender wells. Now make sure that you don't tear these up because you're gonna wanna reuse them when you put the new clip on. This car came out of Florida. I never know what's gonna be inside these fenders. Whoa. Hey, here we go. A little bit of beach sand. <laughs> you think the guy used this out on the beach some? It kind of makes you wonder what was in those seats. <laughs> hey <laughs> Man, that is light. That's like tin foil. Look at this though. Remember all that sand that was down on the bottom? Check that out. No rust. That says a lot for their undercoating. And that's a good thing, too, because just like the headlight buckets, Miata sheet metal is valuable. So we'll set it aside to make that trip to the swap meet. Now, I know, I know. It looks like we're going the wrong direction here. I mean, a few minutes ago, it looked like this car was just about done. <laughs> that's OK, because they always look their worst just before they start to look really cool. Now, since I am in a disassembly mood, we're just gonna move on to the rear, starting with this trunk lid. There you go. At this point, it's still possible, if you chicken out, to bolt all this stuff back on the car and try to forget about this whole thing. You know, get some counseling and try to ask the little car's forgiveness for, for trying to tear it apart. <laughs> you know that ain't gonna happen here, man. There is nothing exciting about keeping a car stock. Now, this show is about modifying stuff and making it yours. So, it is time for the saw. Because remember, the new front end had headlight buckets, not retractable headlights. That means we need to make room for those buckets right here in this area. So this whole corner has got to come off. Now comes the fun part, because it's time to put this nose on the car. But you are going to need an extra set of hands, because you can't do this by yourself. <laughs> the trick here is to center up the clip, and then slowly work your way down the fender and door gap, fine-tuning your mounting holes, the edges, and the radius of the fenders until you have it perfect. Now, I know in watching this show that it looks like we just fit this nose on here in about 30 seconds. In real life, it's gonna take you a little bit longer than that, but only a couple hours. The reason is, you'll need to take this clip on and off a number of times. So you just slowly tweak and cut and file to get it to fit perfectly. But as you can see, this is time well spent because now this thing is fitting like a glove. All right, now we are ready for the hood. And I know you're wondering about the hinges. What do you do? Well, it's pretty simple. You just take your stock hinge, bend it in until it matches the hood line, and then bolt the hood on. Then all you have to do is adjust the hood, <laughs> yeah. and you're done. 
Now that we have everything fit and good, it is time to give this thing a face. So, using these templates supplied with the kit, we're gonna make our openings for the headlights, the turn signals, and the grill. Now, make sure that you don't cut these too big, because if you do, you're screwed. Okay, before we move on to the rear clip, there is one major change that we need to make inside here. Because of the style that we're building into this car, that stock steering wheel has got to go. <laughs> it's ugly. In its place, we are going to put this nardy wheel that we got from BBS of America. Now, as you can see, this is a work of art. It's got the wooden rim, polished aluminum spokes. This thing is beautiful. If you think it looks like an Italian wheel, you're right. It's actually made in Italy by hand. Now, you're probably thinking I'm going to tell you that this is a replica of a classic 60s sports car wheel, right? No. Nardi wheels are actually what came factory on most of your Ferraris and exotic cars back in the day. So this is just a continuation of what they've been doing right for decades. Nardi pretty much wrote the book on classic wooden wheels. Now, to put this in, you just unbolt the old wheel and bolt this on. Now, I shouldn't have to say this, but just a reminder, when you're messing with a modern steering wheel, make sure the battery's disconnected unless you want a mouthful of airbag. At this point, it's rear end time, and that rear clip mounts completely different than the front because it doesn't bolt on, it bonds on. That's right, it glues right over the existing rear clip. Now, let me just deal with some questions right now. Yes, it's permanent. Yes, it's strong. No, it's not gonna come off. No, it's not gonna look bad. It's not gonna look cheap. It's not gonna look phony. Yes, it's gonna look good, but you gotta fit it first. With the rear of the car disassembled, Set the new rear clip in place on the back of the car. Now start checking your fit around the trunk opening. A little bit of a fitment issue right there. It's a little tight. The wheel arches and the rocker panels. Just like the front, you're going to want to trim and sand as needed to get this body section fit nice and snug. That means you're going to be taking the rear clip on and off a number of times before you're done. Also notice that the new body doesn't come all the way to the edge. That's so you can blend the edges with a little bit of filler when you're done to make this all seamless. That's it. Once you're satisfied with the fit of the rear clip, put on the trunk lid so you can make sure everything's gonna line up. This also gives you a chance to step back Take a look and see what this is really going to look like. <laughs> this is sweet. All right, now we'll mark around the edge of the body, pull it off, and then grind a path around the fenders and wheel arches following the lines. Now this needs to be down to bare metal so the glue can get the best bond. Today we'll be cooking something that the squid choked up. Okay, now comes the moment of truth because it is time to bond the rear section on. And we're using this incredibly strong structural epoxy that comes with the kit. Now it has 40 minutes of working time so you don't have to rush. Once you have the epoxy mixed up, spread it on that ground down area and then set the rear clip in place. Keep your side first, try not to slide it, try not to slide it. Now at this point, it's just a matter of screwing the body in place with the supplied self-tapping screws. You start at the rocker, you work your way up the fender and across the top. Now be careful not to over-tighten the screws here. They just need to be snug enough to hold the clip in place until the epoxy sets up. All right, I love that part. Now all you gotta do is take a break because that glue's got to set up for 24 hours. 
Then you'll come in, take your screws out, do the finished body work around the edges, and you are done. It's on, permanent, not coming off, because that is some serious epoxy. Man, it makes JB Weld look like scotch tape. Now, you may have noticed that this body kit has flared the fenders now two to three inches. So, what are we gonna do about wheels and tires? Aha, thought you'd never ask. For wheels, we went to a place called Complete Custom Wheel because their emphasis is on performance, then style. And that's important if you've got something that's gonna be driven as hard as that car. Now, what we've got here is what they call their classic wheel. It's their race proven three-piece design. Got a polished aluminum rim, satin aluminum center. And the cool thing is, a CCW will build your wheels with whatever backspace, whatever offset that you need. And that is important when you're doing a custom fitment like that. Now, of course, we're using 16 by 8s front and rear because we want to get as much rubber underneath that car as possible. Now, speaking of rubber, there you go. We're using the Toyo Proxis T1R because it's an ultra high performance tire. Got a sticky compound, a unique directional tread. These things will give you great handling and traction, wet or dry. Basically, you have racing tire DNA in a street tire, and that is a nice combination. Matter of fact, this whole thing is a nice combination. Matter of fact, wait till you see these on that car. Oh yeah, that's sweet. Now with the only original body lines being the doors and the windshield frame, the car has now taken on a classic look of the golden era of sports car racing. You got the covered headlights, the deck lid, the roll bar. They're all working together to make this thing look like nothing else on the road. <laughs> and it's not even done yet. <laughs> and that's the last that anybody has seen of the Banshee. <laughs> and I've been getting a lot of questions about it. What happened to it? Was all that surgery successful or what? Well, paint is what happened to it. And as far as that surgery being successful, well, you can be the judge of that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, first things first. The paint is once again a collaboration between Ron Payton at PPG and myself. And it is a really cool metallic blue with a metallic silver stripe. Now these have the look and the punch and the sparkle of a three-stage candy color, but these are base clear. Now the reason we do the base clear is because it's a lot easier for a novice or a beginning painter to get good results out of these in their shop. It's also a lot easier to touch up when you scratch it. Of course, the color is called Banshee Blue, and it joins the rest of our custom PPG colors. And you can get these colors at Auto Body Color and Supply in Nashville, Tennessee, or you can go on our website, get the mixing formulas, go to your local paint store, and have them mix them up for you. Now, the paint work on this thing was yeah, carried well, out by cool. Malcolm Pritchett and his crew at West Kentucky Collision Center in Hopkinsville, Kentucky. And they did a fantastic job. Now, don't let the collision name fool you. These guys do superb restoration and custom work as well as collision work. Uh, I've been doing it for 25 years. Uh, my grandfather worked at Ford, uh, painting Model A and Model T cars. My great uncles were all body men. As a matter of fact, I have some of their uh, hand-me-down tools in my tool chest. The body of the Banshee was completely disassembled and then worked and tweaked until every seam, every opening was perfect. Then it was meticulously taped off to keep overspray from going everywhere. With the body all prepped and ready to go, Dwayne started laying on the paint. After that, the guys cut it and buffed it and detailed it and dropped it back off to the shop. Now, the first thing that captures your attention when you look at this thing is that black scoop on the hood. Because you might remember that this body kit did not come with a scoop on the hood. It was just flat. I added that because, first of all, it makes the car look better. Second of all, we can definitely handle some cold air going down into that engine. So yeah, this is functional. Now, if you think that scoop looks familiar, you're right. It's a Boss 302 Mustang Shaker Scoop that we got from Keystone Restyling Products. And it was blended into the hood by Chris Dykus at Dykus Customs. Then to make it all really pop, we painted it with a flat black 
brought out a nice silver stripe to accent the body line, took it all the way down into the nose. The coolest factor in the nose, though, is the covered headlights and the round turn signals that really set off the front end, giving it that classic Ferrari Jaguar look. Under the hood, you'll notice that everything has been all smoothed out and painted to match, so this looks like a factory car. And that is so important to do on your project because you don't want the body and the engine and the rest of the car to look like it came from three different places. No, you want it all to match and make sense. Now, obviously, the best way to do this is to pull out the engine and drivetrain so you can get in there and detail it out properly. And of course, make sure that you redo all your wiring and all your fuel lines so when you put it back together, you pop the hood, it looks like a factory original exotic car. Rolling down the side of the car, you'll notice that the side scoops were opened up and made functional for the proper sports car look. And the fat curves of the body flow all the way around the back, making you think this is anything but a Miata. Matter of fact, the only things left that even hint at the Mazda heritage is the windshield frame and the door handles. Now, obviously, I'm still in the process of putting this thing back together from the paint shop. And as good as it looks, there is still one major piece missing on the body, and that is the side mirrors. Now, this Italia kit doesn't come with any specific mirror, and you definitely don't want to put the old Miata mirror back on because it's just big and gaudy and ugly. It just doesn't match the look of the car now. So to fix that, we went to year one, got a couple of these cool little bullet side mirrors that came on the original Shelby Cobras and the Mustangs and all those 60 sports cars. And that is a look that we're after. So let's get these things on. The first step is to get in the seat and determine where the mirrors need to sit so you can see out of them when you're driving the car. Then drill the holes for the base. Now ideally you want to do this before you paint the car, but in this case the mirrors came in after the car was painted. But if you use tape to protect the paint and take your time, you're not going to have any problem here. That is what this car needed. <laughs> Look at that, that's sweet. And that's the cool thing about a project like this. Every little thing that you do brings it that much closer to being done. And being a 1995 Mazda Miata means that this is very typical of a lot of the late model projects that are sitting out in garages there right now. I mean, it's still a good car, got a lot of good miles left on it, no rust on it. It's just a little tired in the interior, especially the carpet. So we're gonna fix that. Now, putting in a new carpet is not difficult, but it doesn't just jump in by itself either. No, there are some tricks to help you put this in and make it look right. That's what we're gonna show you. Okay, the first thing you need to do to replace your carpet is get everything out of the way. The seats, the door seals, the console, the seat belts, kick panels, everything even the top. At this point, you're gonna be getting a pretty good sized pile of hardware, clips, and fasteners, and it's really easy to get them all mixed up or lose them. Not a good thing. The best way to prevent that is to get yourself a box of Ziploc bags. That way you can bag everything up and mark them so when you're ready for them, they're all there together, ready for you. This is especially important if it's gonna be a while before you put everything back together. Now comes the moment of truth, because it's time to get this old carpet out of here. It should come out fairly easily. <laughs> the question is, what are you going to find underneath it? Yeah. Now, with a car that's only about 10 years old, rust should not be an issue, but you won't know until you get in here. What the? Oh, no way. <laughs> oh, check this out, man. A fake fingernail. I told you we were exercising the estrogen out of this car. It was a little bit still down underneath. The scary thing is I bought this car from a guy. Ooh. Ah, yeah, there you go. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> Other than the fingernail, there were no more surprises under the carpet or rusty floor pans. 
The only thing left to do is clean everything up. <laughs> now, like I said before, we really lucked out with this car, man. Take a look at the floor. There is no rust on this thing. Now, obviously, if you have rust in the floor, you're gonna have to cut it out and repair it before you can put the new carpet down. But if you just have surface rust, that's a little different thing. You can get a rust inhibitive paint like a Bill Hirsch Miracle Paint or a POR 15 or Chassis Saver Paint. All you gotta do is paint it on. That stuff will stop rust in its tracks. Then you're gonna be ready for your carpet. Let's go take a look. All right. For the new interior, we went to a place called Stock Interiors, got the whole setup for a Mazda Miata. Check this out. This is a form-fitted carpet. You got your foot wells and your cross members. There's the tow board. So this thing should drop right into place and just fit great. Also, notice that the jute padding is already glued right to the carpet, so you don't have to chase that around. And then for the rear shelf, we also got that panel. Got the padding in place, got nice finished edges, so this is gonna look great in that car. And the final piece is this vertical panel that goes behind the seats. Now, any time that you are doing a custom carpet installation, you might wanna pick up some extra material and some extra padding because you don't really know when you might need this. Now, if you're putting something in that's gonna create more heat, like a V8, that's when you'd wanna use this because it is not just a padding, it's also a heat shield. Now it's a matter of laying the carpet in and working it to make it fit. Now be prepared to do some pushing and pulling and trimming here. If you start in the center, slowly work your way out, taking your time to fit all the corners and the edges, you'll have a fantastic looking carpet in no time at all. Okay, the one thing that invariably happens when you're working with a form-fitted carpet is you're gonna find that there's some creases and bends and stuff that don't really match what you're doing. And some people will tell you, yeah, you just mash that in and glue it down, but that's, that's not the way to do that. Here's what you're dealing with. You have got to reform the carpet. And the way to do that is with a heat gun. Now, this is not a hair dryer. This is a heat gun. It goes up to 1,000 degrees. And all you have to do is just melt the plastic and reform the carpet. Next comes the rear panel, and using the old carpet as a pattern, we'll just trim it up. Get it in place using some 3M adhesive. And that is it. Quick and easy. And there is no reason that you can't do this to your vehicle in an afternoon and save yourself some serious money. Now take a look at this, look at the difference. It's like a brand new car. Now once you get the carpet in, all you've got to do is reassemble the interior and you're ready to go down the road with your project. Now with this one, <laughs> I've still got some work to do to this one. Now I know you're wondering about the shifter and the exhaust and things like that. We'll get to that in a minute. Now I've got the engine back in. This gives you a good chance to see just how well that engine fits and how that air cleaner is gonna fit around that hood scoop. <laughs> That's cool. Now, the reason the drivetrain's back in is that we need it to help fit the next components that we're gonna put on, like the shifter. Now, we've been getting a lot of questions about the shifter placement on this project, so let's take a look. The new T5 shifter is coming up here, but the stock Miata shifter came up here. So if we're gonna hide all that stuff with a stock console, which we are, well, we have to move the shifter back and to the right. Here's how we're gonna do it. Now, there's no question, we have got to have a serious shifter for this car. So, we went to a place called Purple Hazen because they specialize in performance shifters and wild and crazy shifter stuff too. And we came up with a special gear shifter that's not only gonna be perfect for the Banshee, but for any car that's running a T5 five-speed transmission. Take a look at this. The shifter is precision cut out of billet aluminum, so it's lightweight and strong. This is something you can bang on for years and not damage. Now, of course, it's got a very tight pattern, so you can get in and out of the gears quick. And it has the shifting stops, so you can't overshift the transmission and damage it. 
Then it also comes with different springs that you can change inside that will adjust the tension on the shifter so it will feel the way you want it to feel. Now for the handle, that's where Purple Hazen started living up to their name. Notice they cut it out of aluminum and it looks very similar to the wheels. That's really cool. But the best part is when you bolt it on the shifter, notice it moves it back and to the right exactly what we needed. It's going to come right up in the hole of the console. Now to go with that, we got us a nice little gears knob so we have something that we can really grab onto when we're shifting the gears. The best part is this all bolts right in place at the stock shifter. The next thing to go in are the seats. Unfortunately, the rally seats that I was planning on using here are not gonna work because being over six feet tall, once I had them bolted in, I realized I was looking right at the top of the windshield. Not a good thing. So we're gonna have to reuse the stock Miata seats, but that's not a bad thing because remember I said, the stock Miata seat is not a bad seat. Ours were just the wrong color and really nasty. So we took care of that by shipping them off to B&G Incorporated in Nashville, Tennessee, and they reupholstered them for us. Take a look at this. Not only are they black now, so they match, but we changed the look of the upholstery so it matches the look of the car. The best part is, now I'm gonna fit in the car. <laughs> At this point, we are ready to deal with the exhaust system. So we hooked up with our buddies at Cherry Bomb, laid out a system for this car. Check it out. Starting with two and a half inch diameter pipe, the head pipes bolt right to the header collectors. Then they bend outside the frame rails up underneath the car. Then we welded on O2 sensor bungs. So if we ever want to add fuel injection, we can. Then of course we have the crossover pipe, which will equalize the pressure of the two cylinder banks. Then we added two Cherry Bomb high flow catalytic converters because we want to pass emissions with this car. Then of course it goes on out. Now one thing that's really important to do on a custom exhaust is to flange all of your connections so you can just unbolt the system whenever you want. Now I know this looks like a lot of wild bends here, but you're going to be surprised how nicely this bolts up underneath there. And there it is. <laughs> now, from here on back, we built another couple of pipes that tuck under the rear end, over the cross member, and into the crowning jewels, those Cherry Bomb Vortex mufflers, because they flow like crazy and sound really good. Now, the final touch are these Cherry Bomb polished stainless steel tips. I'm gonna weld them right onto the mufflers. They tuck into these little notches that we cut into the body and are just gonna look incredible as this thing rumbles down the road. I can't wait to hear this thing. You know, since we've been touching on the subject of interiors today, now is the perfect time to deal with the biggest problem that you're gonna face when you're doing an interior. It's the wrong color, or it's faded. Now, if we're talking about a carpet, that's not that big a deal, because you just get a new carpet and put it in. But if you're talking about a panel or a dash, oh, that is a whole different deal. Because if you are lucky enough to find a new panel, it's probably gonna be black and really expensive. If you go to a salvage yard, you're gonna get stuff that's probably the wrong color or faded. So you're right back where you started. Oh, the best thing to do is to try to refurbish your old panels provided they're not cracked or broken. Now, I know some of you guys are going, oh no, I am not gonna try that. And that's because most of us in the past have tried to paint these kind of panels only to have the paint flake off in a week or two and you end up with a bigger mess than what you started with. Well, the good news is there is a way to paint this stuff to where it looks good and lasts a long time. That's what we're gonna show you. Okay, the first thing you need to do is get the parts ready to be painted. Any gouges that need to be smoothed, any parts that need to come off, now is the time to do it.
The next step, and this is a biggie, you have to prep the panels properly. Most interior panels have years of protectants rubbed into them, and they also had a mold release on them from the factory to help them pop out of the mold. Paint will not stick to any of that, so it's all got to come off, and that takes a serious cleaner. Now, I like to use trisodium phosphate, or TSP for short. You can pick this up at the local hardware store. It's a great heavy-duty all-purpose cleaner, and it'll do a great job getting all the nasty goo off these panels. Once the panels are clean and dry, we'll give them a good wipe down with a wax and grease remover to make sure that there is absolutely nothing left anywhere on the panel that could prevent good adhesion. That is why this step is important. There's still some stuff on here. Now, the real key to getting paint to stick to vinyl or plastic is you have got to use a high quality vinyl paint like this from Duplicolor. Now look at that, that is for vinyl. Now the reason that's important is because vinyl moves, man. It expands, it contracts, and this paint will do the same thing so it won't flake off. Now Duplicolor's got this in all kinds of different colors so you should be able to find some to fit your application. Now wait a minute, before you just start shooting paint on, the first thing you need to put on is an adhesion promoter. Now this is basically a clear, light primer that makes your paint stick like crazy. Finally, you're ready for the paint. And it's very important that you don't just glob on big, heavy coats. Now, two or three light coats are the way to go here, so you not only don't get runs, but you also don't fill up the grain pattern in the plastic. And once it's all dried out, you've got a panel that looks brand new. I mean, check it out. Look at the difference between the one I haven't painted yet. Now, look at these pieces. They look like they came right off of the shelf. And they're durable. This stuff is not going to flake off. Now, when you put it all back together, you can use your protectants on it, and it'll last a good long time. The best part is, this is something that's cheap and easy to do. All you need is some cleaner, some Duplicolor, and a few hours. So now, you have no excuse to have a nasty old interior. Get out there and work on it. You know, one question that a guy will ask himself from time to time when he's in the middle of a project is, am I ever gonna finish this thing? And is all this effort worth it? Well, you're gonna find that if you keep at it, you will finish it, and all the effort is worth it. Case in point, the Banshee. Now, we've already walked you through the extensive buildup of this car, but now it's time to take a look at the finished product and see what we got. The Italia body kit not only completely transforms the look of the car, but it gives it the swoopy, curvy lines of a vintage 60s sports car. Yeah, baby! <laughs> However, with roll-up windows and air conditioning... Man, that air conditioning is nice. A stereo... and a real working top, the Banshee is far more refined than something like a vintage Cobra, and actually a car that you could drive every day. To help prove that point, we even took the Banshee out for a spin in the rain. Now, the cool thing about a car like this, it's based off of a Miata. I don't know if you can hear that or not, but it's raining outside. If we were in a Cobra, oh, we would be in trouble. Yeah, there's only one problem. It's raining.
Looks good. There's only one problem. Wow. It stopped raining. <laughs> <laughs> With modern brakes and high-performance suspension, the Banshee will outhandle pretty much anything on the road and is an absolute blast on the road course. The short wheelbase and V8 power have the potential to bring the rear end around pretty much whenever you want to. That blend of power and handling allows you to push the car to the very edge whether you're road racing, drifting, or just messing around. And of course, with that V8 power, you'll be able to pretty much outrun anything, too. The best part is, you can build a car just like this one for around 20,000 bucks. If you don't do the body kit, you can get into a V8-powered Miata for around 10,000 bucks, and that includes buying the car. Guys, that's a fraction of what you'd pay for something like this. Now, after all this, there's still some people that would question why you would want to build something like this. And the simple answer is, <laughs> it's fun. Hey, welcome back to Gears, where we have been putting the Banshee through some serious paces to show you how incredible a vehicle like this really is. It's affordable, it's blindingly fast, and it handles like a mother. But is it legal? Yeah. Emissions are a big deal with hot rods these days, and a lot of you have been wondering why I put a carburetor on this and not a fuel injection. And I did it to prove a point that you can pass emissions with a carburetor and catalytic converters in just about every state but California, which kind of makes you wonder what they base their criteria on if the car is burning clean enough to pass emissions. Yeah, something to think about. So what did we end up with? We ended up with a car that just about anybody can build, just about anybody can afford, and when you compare the cost, the reliability, the usability, and the performance of something like this, you're gonna find that nothing screams like a banshee. <laughs>